Ladies and gentlemen, today on the program, a short trip to a magical place. Yes, we're returning to Summerside, Prince Edward Island. Or, if you're into continuity, we're still in Summerside, Prince Edward Island, where I recorded the very first Rodisode with Ken the Zen, which aired last week on this very program. Before we go any further, I want to thank all of you who took time to say how much you enjoyed the first Rodisode. It was definitely a lot of fun to do, and Ken and I had a ball. And, well, it's nice to know that some of you enjoyed it because it gives me encouragement to move on and do more Rotisodes in the future. And I'm hoping to do one in a week or two when I go up to Timmins with the great Sarah Smith. And, of course, the Europe tour is coming, and so we'll be out there, and who knows who we'll run into. So, yes, the plan is to do more Rotisodes, and I'm glad you enjoyed them. Funny thing about doing a show like this is that it can seem at times like you do it in a vacuum or you can do it in a box. And literally, I do it in an empty room a lot of the time, but uh, figuratively, it can feel that way too. So you make this thing and you put your time into it, a lot of time, a lot of effort, even some money in my case, because Ken the Zen doesn't come cheap. And you put it out in the world and then you don't really hear anything about it sometimes. And so it can feel like you're putting art into a void if you consider this art. And for me, it kind of is. It's, if nothing else, a product. And I know a lot of writers feel that way. Bloggers feel that way. Having been a blogger, it can definitely feel like you're writing to the ether. You're supposed to be writing from the ether, but it feels like you're writing to the ether. And just this great echo, 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 echo. So those of you who have taken the time to say, hey, we liked that episode. Hey, we enjoyed the program. I want to thank you again here publicly on this episode because it definitely does help. And I'm glad to know that it's resonating. I'm glad to know that some of you like it, and by all means, please do contact me if you like the way things are going, if you enjoy the show. I could use a shot in the arm just like everybody else now and again, so please don't hesitate, and I do appreciate it. But now to Summerside, and to that magical little place I referenced, called Seaside Books, and its proprietor, the charming impish, articulate, insightful, intelligent Nancy Quinn. One of the things I like about doing this show is that you never quite know where an interview might go, where a conversation might go. You don't know when you sit down with Phoenix Fire, the fire breather, who lets people staple hot peppers to his tongue, episode one. You don't know when you sit down with him that he's going to talk about mental health and suicide attempts and abuse and this incredibly difficult life and how he's overcome it through these incredible stunts that he does. You don't know that you're going to find out Bethany Butzer, PhD, had the same sort of evangelical upbringing you did and that you share this weird common bond. So. In my case, I didn't even know that Nancy Quinn would be an interview. So double surprises from her, because when we started talking, not only did I find this just really spiritually attuned and wise person, but she actually challenged me. And without expecting it at all, we started to talk about my history in writing the writer's block that I currently experience of sorts. I wasn't expecting to talk about writing because writing is difficult for me. But then, of course, going into a used bookstore, why wouldn't we talk about writing? And so we did, and it was hard. But man, she had some insights on being a creative person and producing art for its own sake, and the kind of mental blocks that we can sometimes get into when we are creative types. 
I wasn't expecting that from her, but when you walk into a place that's magical, why wouldn't you get magic? And Seaside Books really is magical. I was there last year, on tour again with Sarah. Ken and I walked in, and there was a sign out front, and I'm pretty sure it said three. Just the number three. And Nancy told us that three meant she had been open for three days. She was three days into this business. Uh, Which is exciting, but man, oh man, who buys a used bookstore? You know, who competes with Amazon? It's uh, an incredibly bold thing to do, but you know, this was a dream she didn't even know she had. And then she followed this intuition and created this opportunity and just went for it. And well, the next time we walked in a couple of weeks ago, it was day 333 on the sign. Now, you numerologists, pay attention. Funny thing, I was awoken in the middle of the night last night, and I looked over at the clock and it said 333. So numerology experts, get at me with what's going on with the 333s here. Um, I just find that that's a cool synchronicity. And it also means that 330 days later, Nancy's shop was still open. Seaside Books is still happening. And she's doing really, really well. And it was exciting to see that. And I didn't intend to interview her. I just walked in and got a vibe off of the place. And I got a vibe off of her. And sometimes you need to be able to take advantage of that. You need to be able to recognize these vibes that exist. You walk into a room and it feels special. And you feel like maybe there's something here for you. That happens a lot to me in bookstores. And I will find a book that has something that I need in it. In this case, the bookstore had a person that I needed in it. And I had a twig, I had an intuition in my mind that said, hey, you should, you should interview her. You should try and set something up. And I ignored that intuition initially. And we hung out with Nancy for a bit and we looked around and then we walked out. And as I was walking down the street, Summerside, I think it was Water Street, I just stopped on the corner. And I turned to Ken and I said, I'll be right back. And I walked in to Nancy's shop and she was there and it was as though she was waiting for me. And I found out later that in a way she kind of was waiting for me. And she told me later that she was hoping I would come back because she knew about my podcast and she wanted to be on it. And I'm glad she wanted to be on it because we wound up having a wonderful conversation about all kinds of neat metaphysical things, funny celebrity sightings, my conversation about writer's block. She's really great. Her bookstore is really great. And I'm going to plug right now, not only hers, but every independent bookstore, every used bookstore in the country. Go there. Buy books. The people who run those places aren't in it for the money. But that doesn't mean they don't need the money, okay? Go get your books from those people and get books. Books have history. Books are their own stories. Not just the stories in the books, but the books themselves are stories. You know, when you're holding an old book, you're holding a piece of somebody's life. You're holding an artifact. And as she says in this episode, there's some weird magic in that. And those stories are really cool to hold on to. Speaking of stories, I have another one that's weird and cool from the East Coast tour that I just did. This one happens in New Brunswick. Fredericton, we stayed at a place. There's a really great house venue there that we played at and we stayed there and one night after the show I'm empty in my pockets after the show and I've always got way too much stuff in my pockets earplugs and change and keys and you know who knows what and I pulled out something that I did not put in there and it was a little key tag I think it might be pewter it's in the shape of a wing and on one side it says inspire on and on the other side it says you can do it Where did that come from? Probably one of my roadmates slipped it in there, hopefully as a message of encouragement, but maybe they didn't. Somebody did, because I had never seen it before, and I certainly didn't put it there. But man, sometimes life drops these little clues for you. Sometimes life puts them right in your pocket. So if one of my tour mates did that, thank you. Please remain anonymous, because you'll kill the magic for me. I now have this on my keychain, although Tanya the Medium says that since I found it, probably it will disappear again and move on to somebody else. 
But the message was to inspire. The encouragement was to keep going. And as I said earlier, sometimes it can feel like you're doing this in a void, and it can be hard to keep going. But I'm going to keep going for a while anyhow. I've got more people lined up, and we're going to do this. And hey, look for those synchronicities out there. And go patronize local artists, local farmers, local bookstores. Go get a piece of history because there is definitely magic in those places. There is most certainly magic in Seaside Books in Summerside, Prince Edward Island. There is magic in Nancy Quinn, and there is magic in this episode. I hope you enjoy it. Drop me a line and tell me if you did. Please share these episodes around because I hope that they inspire and encourage everybody out there who has a dream. Nancy had a dream to start a bookstore. That's a tough dream these days, my friends. She did it. She is doing it. And whatever your dream is, you can do it too. Inspire on, my friends. And hey, roll intro! You're listening to the John Huff Podcast. Oh, yeah. Oh, 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 oh. And I, I don't mind a little ambient noise in okay. the show. The whole, the whole idea is I want people to feel like they're sitting having a coffee with us. Or a, what did you call it? What did you call the tea? Sun tea, actually. Sun tea. What makes yeah. it sun tea? So uh, it's really uh, just an ordinary tea bag. Uh, or any kind of tea that you want with cold water. You put in a glass vessel, a jar, or I use an old coffee pot and put it in the sun and it brews itself from the heat of the sun. Really? And yeah. And so not only do you, and then you can heat it up, which I often do too. Um, but it gives the, uh, it gives the liquid, a like almost a creamier texture than when it's a mm. boiled outright. Mm hmm. Mm-hmm. Where'd you come up with this idea? It's not my idea. It's been around for a long time. Did you find it in a bookstore here? Or a book here in your bookstore? I would bookstore? love to be able to say yes, <laughs> but actually, it was a friend, so that's really good too. Really? Yeah. So this is day three thirty-three of Seaside Books of in Seaside Summerside. Books. Yeah. Now, my friend Ken and I think we were here on day three. There's a little magic in those numbers, right? Tell me about the magic of three three three. Well, for me, actually, when I, when I changed my, uh, sign at the door, like I do every day, and I put down that third three, and I thought, mm, that makes nine, and nine is the number that seems to reverberate in my life for me. Really? Yep. I'm mm-hmm. traveling with a medium right now, and she oh, would have you? a lot of cool things to say about that. I bet she would. Yeah. Yeah. Nine. I know that repeating numbers, if you're into numerology, mm-hmm. usually portend to different things. Sure, they do. And some people are encouraged by that. I, and I think they should take that encouragement. I think they should, too. Yeah. We should take what encouragement we can. That's right. We all need to do that. So, and to focus on the things that uh, not only are encouraging, uh, but also specifically make us, I think, feel better, feel good. Yeah. Yeah. This dude, like, I had a little glow when I put those three did threes. You? I did. And I'm like, oh, nine. <laughs> that's my number. Nine is your number. <laughs> and what happens on day three, three, three? A podcast host walks in and all of a sudden I we're, know. See? we're doing an I episode. I thought about that, too. Well, mm-hmm. I think about that too because this is, I'm on the road right now and it's hard to do a podcast when you're on the road. It's hard to schedule. What are the challenges? Well, I, no, my show is, is 100% an interview show. Okay. So I need another person. Right. And you, you can't, of course you do. You can't easily schedule that because most of what I do is done via Skype or whatever. It's very rarely in person. So I have to schedule that. And then if I'm on the road, I don't know where I will have Wi-Fi. Right. I don't know. I may be in a different time zone. I, ho- I hope you clocked into the free Wi-Fi here. I didn't, but I, I don't need it for our purposes right now. Okay. But, um, so no, it's, of course, because we're, we're, lo- we're actually recording right here and now, which is lovely. We're recording right here right now. And I'm very honored, by the way, because um, while I've been interviewed, this is the first time somebody said, would you like to do a podcast? Really? And I'm like, oh, this is great. Yeah. Well, this show is about people who are doing unconventional things and who are inspirational for doing it. And well, thank you. I mean, I, I'm a sucker for bookstores. I have a, I have, um, bookstores hurt me a little bit 
because I'm a I'm a writer on hiatus kind of. Okay. So every time I walk into a bookstore and I kind of mm. thumb the books, I'm like, Ugh, feel a little pressure. My books are not here, and I'm not writing one. But there's a sometimes you just sense a divinity. Sometimes you just feel a tug that says there's something here. And so when I came in earlier today, I felt there's a there's an interview here. Well, you would not be the first person uh, that has come in that says. This place, there's something special about this place. Yeah, there there's, is. There's a little, some people will say the word magic. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, some people say um, a woman's touch, which actually kind of always makes me giggle. Because um, clearly there's some girly things going on, like this pink table that we're, nice that, we're table. that you've set up on. It's a nice table. Um, but I think it's their way, there are many ways of describing what, what, what makes uh, people that come in, what makes them feel good. Mm-hmm. So if that if that is where they settle, you know, on that, um, then I'm very happy for them. Yeah. But th- there are much clearer indications, I think, uh, in here um, of uh, a little something extra. Bookstores, especially like indie used bookstores, have that. Cause, they do because books have history. See, that's exactly right? right. And I talk about that. I talk about, you know, when a book is um, clearly passed through many sets of hands. Right. Um, and if the book itself could tell the story. Um, so unlike many booksellers, I don't black out things that are in the books. I'm always delighted when I find little letters and right. mementos inside. Because I appreciate that, that, that uh, this book has maybe been more places than I have. The book has all those books have stories. Why would why would you want to deny that? I was at a garage sale one time or a used bookstore, I can't remember which. And there was a copy on the shelf of a book called Who is Bugs Potter by Gordon Corman. Do you know it? No, I'm not familiar. Do you know with Gordon it. Corman? No, I uh, Oh, uh the adventure kids writer that Corman? Right, probably. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Gordon Corman was writing kids book mm-hmm. kids books when I was a kid. Hmm. I have a number of them, actually. Yeah. yeah, and he was a kid himself. Like he yeah. published his first book when he was twelve or thirteen. Isn't that amazing? Like, yeah, he, just oh, a prodigy, right? Okay. He had a book called "Who Is Bugs Potter," which is one of my favorite books as a kid because Bugs Potter was a drummer. Okay, and, and that's drummer. your heritage. That's cool. me. Yeah. yeah. And so I was drawn right away to this novel about this this drummer, Bugs Potter. And so many years later, I I saw a copy of this book for sale. And I picked it up, and I opened it, and it was signed <gasps> by Gordon Corman. So somebody, somebody had given away their signed Bugs Potter. Can you imagine? So for many years, uh, I collected books, mm-hmm. um, and I was always excited when I found one or acquired one that had a signature of somebody I very much admired. So I do understand that, absolutely. But what surprises me is exactly what you said. How many people give up their signed copies? Um, because I do get a lot in here. But, you know, uh, the, the books that end up here come here for a variety of reasons. Um, and some of those reasons are sad, not happy. I bet they are. Um, I've had people in tears giving up their books. Um, really? Oh, yeah. Because when you choose a book and you read it and you love the story, whether or not you read it again or uh, lend it or don't lend it, it becomes part of you. You know, people people have a very strong connection to these books that they oh, yeah. love the story that's within the covers. So when a circumstance occurs that they have to give up the book, um, yes, some people are very sad. Mm. Those of us who are book people have a, a reverence for the books. It's true. That And that makes this place kind of a church. Well, um, it's... <sighs> Uh, I often compare what I do here to a humane society. Yeah, uh, sure. Everybody knows what a humane society does, right? They they temporarily look after animals that don't have a home. Might be overnight, which happened to me recently. Well, it was only an hour. Huh? <laughs> um, and, and maybe for many weeks. Um, and that's exactly what happens here, is that people bring uh, their books uh, that they cannot keep for for a million different reasons. And I look after them until the next owner comes along. Really? Mm-hmm. Yeah. That's exactly how I feel about it. That's a great way to look at it. And I was thinking, when we were talking about how books, physical books have a history, are you familiar with the writer called Tibor Fischer? No. Nope. He's a Hungarian slash British writer, novelist, and he, he wrote a bunch of really great books, The Thought Gang, Under the Frog, 
he has another book and the title of it is escaping me for some reason right now but the main character in the book told first person by this character is a 5000 year old clay pot okay right mm-hmm. and so the pot which is also a shapeshifter it can become almost anything it wants is an entity and it and right. it, it it tells its story yep all of the owners it's had all the things that have happened the things that have been put in it the disgusting things yeah. the wonderful things right it's it's a really, really funny novel. It sounds engaging. It's a great book. And it was Fisher. T. War Fisher, F I S C H E R. Okay. He's one of my favorite writers. And yeah, that made me think of that. Like, if these books could talk, what have they seen? You know, it's magic. It's not the only way they have magic. Uh oh. So, so I can, I, I, if you'd like, I can relate a couple of stories that have happened. All the stories you want, yes. So how about I start with the first interview that I had? So here on the island, we have a, a publication called The Buzz. It's a local entertainment paper. Okay. Covers all the art, all the arts and culture. So they sent somebody down to do a story about me opening the store. A very nice woman. We had a lovely, engaging conversation. And as she was wrapping up, she all of a sudden jumped and, 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 and had a, this look of shock and dismay on her face. And I said, is, are you okay? Is everything okay? Because I'm a nurturer, uh-huh. and she said she pointed with a shaky finger uh, to a yellow post-it note that I had stuck up some days ago with the word in green ink written choices, and she said, "What's that word? What what is that doing there?" And I said, "Oh, um, a very offhand because it was." I said, "I just stuck it up there." I said, "I moved it over there because I I just wanted." people to twig onto it and think about all the choices that we have, not just in here of the ideas and, and that are in the books, but all the choices that we make every day. Wow. And, and she said, she said, oh, well, it's a very important word to me too. And she rolled up her sleeve on her left arm and showed me on her forearm, forearm from elbow to wrist uh, the word choices. Really? And she said, I had this tattooed last night. Oh, spooky. Yeah. No, fitting. Cool. Really cool. But it- we were both, we were both, a li- I mean, it, it was, this is, a, this was true. So, and we were both, uh, I think a little shocked, you know, a little bit, you know, when you're faced with a, a situation, uh, an occurrence like that, um, even though you may have heard about them, may have experienced them, may probably have read about them, uh, it's still a little bit of a jolt. It's but it great. was it was really lovely, actually. I love it. Yeah. I love it. What else do you said? Have you got another one? So um, I carry a number of uh, Christian books, and there's always a few Bibles, and of sure. course there's all the other religions uh, that I carry here. You know, you name it, I've got a book about it. Um, but there's a fairly solid selection of, of Bibles. Um, and one day one of my regulars came in, he'd been in a number of times and he's a paperback reader. I always picks two or three paperbacks up, which he did this lovely day. And he was on his way out and he turned, he said, Oh, I need a Bible. And the way that he said it was very offhand. Like, Mm. Oh, at that last minute, I remembered that thing. Right. Lettuce, tomatoes, and a Bible. That was today. Right. (laughs) And I said, oh, sure, I've got a number. And because he said it very casually and because he's the kind of reader that he is, I went over to the Bibles and I pulled one out and I said, here's a nice $5 one, right? Mm -hmm. Nice, complete, you know, old, new, whatever. Sure. And he said, well, he said, I I thought I'd get something a little nicer, which surprised me. Um, But I was gratified to hear he was upgrading (laughs) because, you know, of course, I do try and stay in business. Anyway, he said, how much is that big leather one up there? And I said, you know, I don't know because it was er in early days and I didn't really, I wasn't on top of every single price of the more than 20,000 books that I have. Still not. But The inventory was here when you bought the book. It was. It was here. Right. So anyway, we pulled the Bible down. And, uh, I, I was holding it, uh, because it, it was a, a big, heavy family Bible and I wanted to be sure that the spine didn't get cracked. And I opened it up and in, and in the front, it was a beautiful frontispiece, lots of stained glass sort of art, um, very colorful. And it said family Bible. And he, he turned the page and it was the whole family was recorded there. Oh, wow. No, you know, no, that was not my reaction. My reaction was, oh no. Now he's not going to want it because all these names are in it. Sure. 
So I start to close and I go, you probably want a, a clean. And he's like, well, I'll just have a look. Yeah. Anyway, so he took the, the, he took the Bible from my hands and he, he cradled it in his arms and he started to read. And all of a sudden he said, Oh my God. And I thought, Oh, mm-hmm, huh? right. And he said, this was my great aunt's Bible. No way. These are all my cousins. I know everybody. And I'm, and I, and I closed the book on his arm and I said, then you must have it. <laughs> You gave and it to he, him? I tried. Oh, uh, wow. I tried because I, I thought, you know, it's, it's, this, it's come full circle. It's coming back into his hands. I can't take money for that. Right. And I, this is what I said to him. And he said, no, 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 you're in business. You have to take some money. And, and it was $25. And he said, just, just here's the 25. And I said, Oh, I said, I'll take the five. And he said, no, take the 12. We had, we went back and forth. Yeah. So I did end up taking some money for it. Um, but he was so thrilled and so pleased. Uh, and to me, that was magic. What are the chances? Yeah. I know. Although, to be fair, all of the books here are sourced from the island. So that narrows it down quite a bit. But the fact that he looked at that particular book, and I did have some other fine, fine Bibles on the shelf, um, and chose that one and, um, didn't dismiss it out of hand because it had been written in by a family, um, but took the moment to peruse it and all of a sudden found his treasure. Wow. Mm-hmm. Were you expecting that kind of story when you bought this place? No. Really? Not any of it. I, the things that, um, the things that have, I didn't, I guess the biggest unexpected thing for me was, I, I, I love books. I've always been, uh, a reader and a collector, but, uh, I didn't expect to fall in love with the bookshop and its complete contents the way that I did. Really? And there was a, I, I mean, I still come in every morning and say, Hey guys, or morning, yeah. or I'm back. That's sweet. <laughs> um, but I didn't expect to fall in love. Uh, the way that I did. Really? And, uh, I really, it, it felt, I felt like a 16 year old girl with her first crush all over again. It was just bloody marvelous. Yeah. I mean, it was, you know, and I, like I, you know, look around and I tremble, you know, <laughs> like it was really, it's, you know, and I, I still feel that kind of, uh, childish, uh, glee and joy about all of it that's so mm. wonderful yeah it's totally cool tell, i'm so lucky tell me about this when did this like when did this begin this thought of getting this place and actually buying it well uh um we did look at a bookstore about 15 years ago um lightly we looked at it yeah. and um, it wasn't the right time our children are little we have two grown-up sons now um and but you know, I guess I was a 10 year customer of the store before Were I you? marched in one day and I said to Richard, who owned the store for 21 years to the day when he handed the key over. Wow. I said, Richard, power to buy in one by one. How much for the whole shooting match? He kind of rocked back on his heels and he said, really? He said, you want to buy it? And I said, I do. Was it for sale at that time? No. Mm-mm. Really? Yeah. Okay, go which, on. which we both got a lot of flack for. <laughs> Because I think other people might have been interested too. I don't know. Um, hey, hey, you have to take initiative. Well, I did, right? Um, and uh, yeah, I, 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 frankly, it almost came out of my mouth without a real intention. Really? So we after after uh, that, we we were some months in in negotiation. Yeah. Yeah. What were you doing previous to that? I was with municipal government. I worked for the city of Summerside for a number of years. Okay. Um, and I've always, I've always been an entrepreneur. I've had really? many, oh yeah, I've never, but I never had bricks and mortar. Right. This was a big, big change. For sure. Um, cause I'd, I'd done consulting, which, you know, at one, at one point, uh, I guess I always was on a computer when I did consulting, but, um, certainly, nothing you know i i'd worked in retail years ago when i was a youngster you know I, different different game altogether sure so no i uh, i was i was looking for something to do i wasn't sure what i wanted that to be yeah but then i knew i yeah. thought yep this is you know this is what i wanted to do you wanted this bookstore yeah bookstores are generally considered risky business <laughs> Well, as a business consultant, I did know that. Yeah. Um, and I've had many people tell me. 
Yeah. I'm sure if you I have. didn't know, I'm sure many you have. people have said, "Oh, you know, nobody's reading these days. It's too bad. Everybody's got the Kindle." You know? <laughs> um, Kindle has no history. And I and I I mean that scared me. And I, and to be fair, um, for the first time in opening a business or starting something up. I really didn't do the due diligence that I would recommend to any of my clients. Really? Nothing. 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 Didn't visit other bookstores. Didn't even go up to the mall to visit the the bookstore at the mall. Didn't do any of that. Really? Mm-hmm. It was, it was, I, I very much rushed right in and said, I can do this. I can make this work. I, does, I don't care what people are saying. I have faith in the books. I believe in the books. I believe that I am not the only person. I might be the only person who's like the crazy book lady, <laughs> but I, I, w- I felt very, very confident that um, there were many other people like me that felt like me, that feel like me about books, yeah. um, that love to hold the book, that love to keep the book, sure that do. love to you know find the whole series of the book. Yeah. And I, I, I haven't let go of that. I even even the many, many times that people have said discouraging things. Yeah. And the five days through winter when nobody came in the store. That will five, that will happen. Five days, John. Five days straight? <laughs> no. <laughs> that would have been really <laughs> debilitating. No, on and one of them was a storm day. Oh, Everything right. was shut. I came in because I thought, Oh, I just want to go to the shop. That's so nice. How many yeah. people would go into work? Just because they wanted to be there, like not very many. This is the this is the beauty of being an entrepreneur. It is right, mm-hmm. um, and I sort of am one too. Sure, obviously, I'm yeah. A, I'm a traveling musician, yes. Also a freelance writer, mm-hmm. and so making I, your living in the arts. I work from home, mm-hmm. so home is where you know a lot of the time. Some of the time, I work in Summerside PEI, which is where I am at Clearly. this moment. Yeah, um, with a view of the ocean. Yeah, but this. It's uh, it's a romantic thought for a lot of people. A bookshop. A bookshop or any kind of a shop. And, y- yes. Um, but, you know, you did it. And and there must have been some hard stuff. What was it like on opening day, the first day? Oh, I, you know. Day one. The fir- I say the first 90 days are just a blur. Yeah. Like really a blur. Um, I probably really... Uh, I really started paying attention in November. So as, as a strategic business consultant. So maybe, you know, a couple of months in, I, I really started to pay attention to a lot of things. And, and I continue to do it. And, and, and so, you know, that helps. But yeah, the, the first, the first 60 to 90 days, really, truly, I, I, there was so much, uh, new information that sure. I was trying to, there's so many people I was trying to learn. Um, I had to learn my stock. Yeah. You know, I had to, I, I had to, I had to, uh, do a lot of organizing. I had to, you know, m- uh, I redesigned the store layout. I bought new shelving, you know, so I had, I, a lot of it, was reactionary. Sure. Um, but yeah, I, I mean, there was, there was, there were, so really the first day, I, re, I look at the pictures and there's joy on my face. That's great. Yeah. Um, so there good. were a lot of pictures taken. So that was really nice. And all my, all my dearest friends and my family came in and, and, and support and, um, it, like it felt special. Yeah. 330 odd days later. You still have that joy on your face. Oh, I do. You're just beaming. Oh, okay. And it's, <laughs> it's the true. end of the it's the end of the work day, and you're it, just it is. you're just um, so excited. I am, you know, because while I'm speaking to you, I can't help but look around um, at my books, and I, I well, I see many, many old friends. I see particular things that I'm extraordinarily proud of having. Um, um, I, I, I think, you know, you make me think, you're making me think about all the things I did to get to where I am today, yeah. you know, cause most of my time I, I do spend thinking about what I've yet to do. Right. Um, and the things I want to accomplish with sure, this. Sure. Yeah. So it's nice to reflect. It really is. I bet. Yeah. I bet. Did you grow up here? No, I'm, I'm a CFA. I'm what Islanders, people who are born here, um, call a come from away CFA. <laughs> So this is endemic anywhere in the Maritimes, uh, and uh, because it's the oldest really part of Canada other right. than than um, southern Ontario. Um, but really, in rural communities, 
everywhere in the world, and we can all attest to this, those of us who have traveled, you know that the people who have been there generation after generation are always a little bit suspicious of people <laughs> that come because they, they say this thing, why would you want to live here? Right. And I, maybe they want to get away. I don't know. But I, I think it's a wonderful place. I, we've been in Summerside for 12 years, just coming up to 12 years. So where did you come from? Uh, just before this Nova Scotia and just before that Ontario, which is uh, where uh, I married my husband, although we met in Columbus, Ohio. And uh, our children were born in Niagara Falls, and I have a lot of family left there. Mm -hmm. Is that where you live, Niagara Falls? Yeah. Oh, lovely. Yes, it's a beautiful city. It is. Mm -hmm. Most people don't get past uh, the, the museums yeah. and the water. Yeah. Um, yeah, but when you live there, it's a, it's a, it's a stunning. There are beautiful gardens everywhere, a fantastic river to spend time yeah. on. Yeah. yeah. So, what took you from Niagara Falls to Nova Scotia? Uh, really, two big things. Um, one was I'd come to a point in my career where I was spending more time than I wanted driving to Toronto to meet with clients. It's a very busy stretch of highway. Oh, it's at awful. points, there's 16 lanes. It's awful. And, you know, and at that time, I was an early adopter with a flip phone. Were you? Oh, totally, yeah. <laughs> Manicure and heels and pencil skirts with suits, you're right. And like a giant purse on your arm and a Starbucks <laughs> and a little doggy in the purse? I didn't have the doggy. Oh, okay. <laughs> But, but what, what you're, in fact, get this, I worked for an advertising agency. Uh -oh. So if you've ever seen the show Mad Men, yeah. which talks, which is a portrayal of ad agencies in the early, late fifties and early sixties, it was still like that. This, I, it was a great portrayal of like, yeah, <laughs> yeah, I, I thought so. I was an agency writer for Were a you? year. Yeah. <laughs> I yeah. was. So I did that. And then I, so, you know, I was getting, the driving was a lot, um, and leaving Niagara and driving around what they call the Golden Horseshoe, yep. um, you, I, there would be a point when the, the smog, it would be like driving into a wall of smog. Yeah. Um, and so that, that piece of that, and then 9-11 happened mm -hmm. and, uh, that pretty much did me out of a, my career at the time. Really? How so? Uh, I was in tourism. Okay. Um, and even George Bush was trying to encourage Americans to travel, if you remember. Uh, we were decimated in Niagara. We lost 90% uh, of our bookings. Wow. Um, and that was across the board. Yeah. Um, all of the people that I had been working with for years were laid off, including and me too. It was, it was, that was what happened. Wow. It was a huge economic impact. Yeah. And so I said to my husband, oh, let's get out of here. And it wasn't just the job. It was uh, uh, living in a border town changed. Um, uh, I had, right. Yeah. Borders changed. Borders, changed. Ev everybody understands how the borders change. When you live on a border, when you lived on the U.S. border prior to 9-11, it was pretty much like crossing a bridge to go and get milk. And right. we all did it. Yeah, we we bought our milk on the and you know on the other side. We bought our gas on the other side. Yep. we shopped. We we ate dinner. All of that stopped um, because border restrictions changed so much. And the day that I was walking my boys in the baby carriage down, uh, we live very close to the river. Um, and at the bridge, the old bridge in Niagara, there was a fellow standing out front with full bandolier of, 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 of ammunition and a very large chubby gun cradled in his arms. And he had a flak jacket. And I mean, this was right after 9-11. This is maybe yep. a month after. So, I mean, everybody was still on high alert. Absolutely. And I said, I can't live here anymore. Right. I, I don't want to live here anymore. The energy changes, right? It did. It entirely changed. So we came out to the Maritimes. I was very fortunate. I got a job with the Katie. University and they moved us out. Oh, so we great. ended up for a while in Nova Scotia. Beautiful place. Mm -hmm. And then I got an offer here uh, and we moved here. Okay. Yeah. And then I did this. At all of the, and at any of those times you're thinking, man, I'd like to own a nope, bookstore. Not really. I'm nope. really curious about this decision no. to buy a bookstore. And you know, everybody attribute it, attributes it to a dream of my whole life because everybody knows I'm a reader. I grew up, I was always the girl with a hat on. 
in the corner reading the book. Uh-huh. It doesn't matter where I was. I could be at a ball game. I could be at the bar. Right, I could right. be in the park. I always had the book. Yeah. So, I mean, everybody knew me as a reader. And um, so it made sense to them when I bought a bookshop. So, you know. um, but it wasn't actually a, a lifelong dream to have a bookshop. I think I thought about it when I was 12 and then briefly again, as I said, when I was in my early, early mid 40s. But again, it was it was in and out in a week or two. Right. So it wasn't really a lifelong dream, but yeah. it turned out to be exactly the right thing for all the right reasons. Really? All of the things that I've ever done, uh, professionally or personally. Yeah. I, I, I do things here and I think, oh, I know how to do that or that's because of this. Right. So it all seems to make sense that way. So cool. Yeah. I'm really lucky. I am really lucky. Well, because not everybody tumbles into that. But here's the interesting thing, John. All my life, and this is the truth, and I may not have ever expressed this before out loud. Oh, boy. Here we go. All my life, I wanted to be that person who, who t- talks about, when I was six, I knew I wanted to be a mountain climber. Right. And all their life, they do all the stuff until they're the mountain climber, and that's what they do. Right. Right? That they knew at that very early age with complete conviction exactly what they wanted to do and i always wanted to be that person i always wanted to say oh i always wanted to be a veterinarian and then i you know yeah it didn't but i never even knew i didn't have the thing i wanted to and i never related my passion uh for books into doing this i I never thought about it like that so it wasn't until you reached this stage of your life that you even you didn't even maybe know this is what you wanted to do when you started doing it. You're absolutely correct. But it, it turned out to be the thing. Yeah, it turned out to be the thing. So that's really encouraging for people who yeah. are not in their 20s anymore. I'm almost 55. <laughs> you have the spirit of an 18-year-old. I think I'm stuck at 23. 23 that's a great is great place to be stuck. <laughs> Fabulous. I know. But, but, I know. So, but yeah, the, you know what? I, I, I like all of a sudden, uh, I woke up and there it was and I had all the right stuff for it. And unbeknownst to me, there had been a, some sort of plan, I think, right? Uh, that got me here, even though I w- didn't know I was on the train. It's so exciting because a lot of people, I think a lot of people want that too, uh, to know what they want. I'm one of those people. And uh, it's encouraging when you see somebody who it, it doesn't always happen when you're super duper young. It probably almost never happens when you're super duper young. You have to go out and live. And if you're not sure, then you've got to sample things and do things. And But you have to have a faith, I suppose. Did you have a faith that no, at I'm some not, point? No, I'm not. Um, no, not really. Not when I think comparatively about how some people – um, practice their faith. So I was brought up in a, a Christian. I was brought up in, uh, like until, you know, I was maybe in double digits. So my early life, you know, Sunday school, that yeah, sort of thing. And not too. uncommon in the sixties and seventies. Sure. I never joined the church. Yeah. And um, I guess, uh, I have a very singular belief. Uh, because every time I, um, you know, learn about or find out about some sort of religious group or belief sect, uh, or, or group of beliefs, there's always something in there that I'm not comfortable with. Sure. So I guess I've sort of cobbled together my own sense of belief. And clearly I believe in, uh, serendipity. Well, that's the um, thing, right? Yeah. And, uh, um, I, I do believe in good and evil. Um, I do believe that, that we have an inner conscience that guides us for the most part to be good people. All, yeah. not all of the time, but most of the time. Yeah. Um, I, I think, um, I, I certainly believe in a higher power of some kind. Do you? Yep. So did you have a belief? When I say for, somebody's really revving an engine out there, it's yeah, terrific. Yeah, When I, um. It's part of the summer, it's part it's, of the summer we are, picture. We are in a summer we're, we're in at Summerside. the back of the bookstore overlooking the ocean, we and are. there is some traffic. It's probably the most scenic place I've ever conducted an interview. Oh, thank you for saying that. Yeah. One of the things I wanted done was a, a new window put in, which I got. Which you got? Yeah. Um, I did an interview with Seamus Evely, a friend of mine. One of the early episodes was done in his flower shop. Oh, So lovely. that was nice. 
And I sat in the singer-songwriter Sarah McDougall's kitchen. Oh, cool. I, I, Less scenic than this bookstore, but Sarah has a lovely kitchen. It was brand new. We're going to close this window because motorcyclists have this obsession with revving their motorcycles. They do. Why do they do that? I wonder. Maybe a motorcyclist will write in and tell me what the obsession is with revving the motorcycle. Maybe they just have to check the engine. I, I don't want to speculate. What were we talking about? We're going to close the door now. And yes, I will edit most of this out. So when I, when I talk about having faith, I yep. mean having a belief that you'll find your way. Yes. Yeah. Um, you know, when something like this happens to you, uh, because this has happened to me, it only has strengthened my belief that there's some sort of plan. Um, and all the things that we call coincidence or deja vu or serendipity right. um, might possibly have a lot more um, based in a, in, in a science, uh, which we just really don't understand yet. I, I do believe that there is reason, and I do believe there's science that we haven't uh, we don't fully understand yet. I had an episode about this a, f a few episodes back with um, Bethany Butzer, who is a psychology professor who has begun to do research on metaphysics, mm -hmm. some of the spiritual yep. stuff. She's trying to marry the academics with the spirituality, which is really fascinating. Um, actually, there's a lot of research being done. Um, probably Cal State uh, um uh, university would be an example of, of, uh, a lot of scientific study. And, you know, this is nothing new because, um, scientists, uh, throughout, uh, our history, uh, particularly, let's say in Europe, um, have a, had for many, many years, of course, been chasing after something called the philosopher's stone. Right. The elixir of life. Sure. Um, uh, but also something that they called the ether. Hmm. Um, and the, the ether, uh, to, let's say, medieval scientists, you know, 1300s, 1400s, and 1500s, the ether was something that they understood to be in the atmosphere around them, but they couldn't identify exactly what it did and what it didn't do. Okay. So they did break it down. And as science matured, um, oxygen was discovered, right? Ah. So thing, so there was something that they, they knew was there because they could feel it filling their lungs. Sure. And they understood there was something there, but it was a while before they identified it and quite a long, a long time later before it really made it to, you know, say the periodic table. Right. Yeah. So we are yeah. in this stage right now where we can sense metaphysical things yeah. without being able to identify That's or right. prove That's them. That's what I think. Or prove them. Yeah. Yeah. And I think something as simple as buying a bookstore mm -hmm. is just wonderful evidence in the way that this happened. And my own story is very much the same. Is that right? Um, I've talked about this in other episodes, but my whole thing was I was a writer for a long time. Mm -hmm. And it was killing me because I wasn't succeeding at it. And I I developed a, a case of writer's block. Some, sure. some people say that doesn't exist. It exists for me. Yeah. And I kind of fell apart as a fiction writer, which was the dream. Mm -hmm. And then sort of in the throes of this, I was at a resort in Jamaica with my wife. I was a musician all along, too. I just wasn't really playing out. Right. And there was a house band playing covers at the resort in Jamaica. Cool. After dinner. Every night for an hour. And they were having a ball, right? And I was up in the martini bar. And I may have had an apple martini, which may have influenced this story. Sure. But I heard a voice, I swear it was audible, that said, you have to start playing music now. Like, it was just an intuition that was that powerful, yep. right? Mm -hmm. And I had been resisting this for a long time. I said, okay, I will. And f within a couple of months, I was in a band. And then what blew up from that is me sitting here right now. Sure. Right? Isn't that great? Music has taken me all across Canada, the States. Europe. Uh, mm -hmm. It's my website exists because of music. My podcast exists because my website exists. Like it all marries together. This simple intuition to start playing music. And the irony of ironies is I brought you the book that I wrote, mm -hmm, which is awesome. When I was because of playing music. So it's like. And my birthday is in November. Is it? <laughs> yep. There you go. So um, 
these serendipities are powerful. And I, they, they are. I had one But today. here's the thing. Okay, Go before ahead. you tell your story, yeah. I'm just going to say the pivotal piece of all of that that you just said was you listened. Right. And you have to act. But first, first you have to listen right. and accept the, accept that thing that you're hearing. And this is something that a lot of people don't do very well. Right. Because we're not taught to listen. Sure. Um, even though our parents say, now you listen to me. Right. right? We're not taught to listen to us. Yeah. Right. Right. So the fact that you opened yourself up and listened is like, that's something that people don't do. Right. Well, I was good at not doing that too. Right. But so tell me your serendipitous story. Well, it's very simple. We were in here today, and uh, and I'm walking around. I'm on the road for about two weeks right now, and I try to bang out an episode every week. Right. I'm in the bookstore, and and I'm I have like I have next week's episode ready to go. Sure. Well, actually, this week's episode, I guess it is. Uh, and as I said, it's hard on tour to make interviews happen. Right. It's like I'm walking around here, and it just Jumped into my head. Nancy's a great interview. Oh, cool. She bought a bookstore. <laughs> Who buys a bookstore anymore? And it's here still a year later. So I was thinking this while you were walking around the store because you'd already said you do podcasts and I th- of interesting people and things. And I'm like saying to myself, I'm interesting. I'm interesting, <laughs> mister. <laughs> so, me. So, you know, and it, it jumped into my head like Good. this is a story. This is yeah. – and, and I could – I can just feel it off of you that yeah. that this is a will be a really cool conversation. And I'm outside on the street, and we're waiting for our friend to catch up with us. And it's just like it's ringing in my head. Go ask her to do an interview, dude. You have nothing to do tonight, anyways. Cool. This is perfect. Yeah, but you have to listen. Yeah, right. And so I came back in, and I asked you. And it, I, I, I was. I'm going to tell you, I was not surprised when you came back in. Really, I wasn't, because I was surprised when you left without asking. <laughs> <laughs> I, I was. I thought I, I would make a good story because yeah. you know clearly we have some, uh, <laughs> you know, uh, cerebral connection, and um, I thought it was very nice that you, you and your colleague came in and talked about. When you had been here the first week, and and uh, and I thought, oh, and I thought, oh, okay, fine. So, and then you walked back in, and I thought, oh, good, I'm really glad. <laughs> like I was so glad when you walked back in because I good. knew what you were going to ask. Did you? Oh, sure. Oh, because you looked yeah. a little bit freaked out because I asked you. Well, like, I was a little. Freaked I asked out. you when do you close and what are you doing after? I like, know. oh man, where's he going with this? No, 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 no. You had no, 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 <laughs> no. I knew, I knew, I knew. I just thought actually you're going to say, oh, can you, we go back and do it here? And it was going to be really complex. And then you very kindly said we could do it here. I yeah. try to make it easy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. But again, you you have to listen to these things and you have to take I've done this a lot already in in just pitching the show to people. Sure. It's like all right, this person doesn't know who I am. Yep. And I, and well, I did Google you. Well, after the fact. <laughs> after the fact, yeah. But I mean, I, I still intended to be here and everything, but I thought right. I should know a little bit. I yeah. I mean, I've pitched to some people who are famous people like That's great. I, I've and it, it's intimidating to do that. Yes. Um, but you have to act on these things. Like you- The only thing that kind of w- I was a little worried about was just how famous you were. I, I had some famous people in a couple of weeks ago. Tell me. So, it was very odd. It was all very odd, John, because these three people, it was a Sunday. Mm-hmm. I'm open 12 to 4. From noon till about 2 o'clock, it was quite busy quite busy and then things quieted down until there was nobody in the store you know doing that thing where your thumbs twiddling your thumbs yeah and um and these three people came in two men and a woman and uh, i did my normal welcome to my store like every time i say it i feel good so i say it to everybody that i can um and they were not impressed they they were quite chill really i said can I help you find anything or would you just like to browse? And they said, we're just looking. I said, okay. Okay. So I backed off and a couple of, you know, they were here for a little while and, and, and they were building pile of, of books on, on my desk to purchase. And the pile was getting quite large. <laughs> and, uh, you know, a couple of other people came in, a couple of other regulars drifted in and sort of drifted out. And one of my, uh, regular uh, volunteers came in. And she's very bubbly. Uh. And she came in, hi, Nancy. Nah! 
<laughs> she's and and um and I said, Oh, um, just so you know, we're having a whispery day. Mm-hmm. So I took her up front and you know, got her doing something a little quiet. And then my son came in and walked in and stopped dead and kinda looked around and handed me some food and said, Oh, I'll be back and anyway, both of them said to me later, they said it was really weird in the store that day. The whole energy was different. Right. It was very different. And these three very intense people were shopping and, and, and getting together their purchases. So finally the, the one chap comes up and he, 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 you know, uh, spoke very nicely to me. And a couple of times they did say, do you have anything like this? And they asked for a specific kind of book. So he, he made his purchase and the other fellow comes over and he had, I think the, 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 they, the woman just put them on, you know, I don't know. Who. Anyway, the second chap came up and, um, made his purchase and then he leaned across the desk and he said, do you have anything on Oak Island? And I said, um, yeah, I'm, yes, just, and I go, wait a minute. I go, are you from that Oak Island show? And he head dropped it. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, you are, you are from that show. And he was very, very attractive man. Uh, very attractive. You know, when you meet somebody attractive and you can see they're attractive, but you're not attracted to them, hmm. you know, they're not your type, right? Okay, sure. <laughs> okay. okay. Uh, well, I, I looked at him and I thought, and I actually thought, oh, he's movie star handsome, but like, I know what his type is and I'm not it and I'm married. Anyway, he just wasn't my type, but he was very attractive. And I looked at him and I said, you're the star, aren't uh, you? <laughs> and his head dropped, his head dropped down, his chin hit his chest again. And I said, oh, that's so nice of you to come in. And I said, actually, I do have a treasure that you'll be interested in. Turned out he wasn't interested in, in purchasing it because it's very dear. Um, but I, I have a feeling, well, who knows? I, I think they might contact me again. Anyway, they were from the show Treasure of Oak Island or whatever it's called. I don't watch TV, but I was able to say to him, oh, you know, my husband and my sons record your show because I see it on the PVR list. Yeah. Um, when I'm looking for the Blue Jays. And, uh, and so that was very nice. And no sooner than they had left the store than, um, well, I, I went right to the middle because at that point there were several people in the store. So I went to the middle of the store and I said, attention all shoppers. <laughs> I go, thank you for your most Canadian attitude towards that. I am sure there are people here that knew who those people were. And thank you for not rushing them. And that was really cool, right? And did they know? Oh, yeah. There was a woman in the, <laughs> there was a woman in the, in the, uh, pop fiction maze and she started popping up and down on her like jumping up and down saying i thought it was him i thought it was him i heard him and then i knew it was him oh my god oh my god (laughs) but bless her heart like she just let the whole thing kind of happen around her no it was kind of cool i once saw ed robertson from the bare naked ladies in the (laughs) airport in cancun That's my brush with that. That's That's my unexpected brush. I mean, I've been around some famous musicians. Yeah, yeah. Cool. Wasn't expecting to see Ed at the airport with his family, you know? Same thing, Rick Mercer. Oh, I have a Rick Mercer too. Oh, do you? So I was, uh, I used to work for the public school board in London where I live. And um, I was in a conference in Ottawa and we were staying at the Chateau Laurier, I guess. Is that the Ottawa one? Yeah. The really swanky one. Overlooks the canal. Yeah, it's beautiful. My room will. <laughs> Love, lovely hotel. Yeah, yeah, sure. And, it is. and thank you to the people of Ontario for providing that to me and my colleague. And um, I walked into the lobby. Hey, when we checked in, we checked in with the New York Islanders. Oh, fun! So I was amongst all of these enormous humans. <laughs> yeah. Checking in. Later, I walked into the lobby, and there was like a people were like taking photos or whatever. Mm. And it was Rick Mercer. Cool. In the lobby. doing With the hockey guys? Nope. No? Totally separate thing. <laughs> he's a tiny, tiny man. Yes, he's little. <laughs> he's like just barely tiny. I know. I was shocked by that too. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And uh, he was right there. It was amazing. Rick Mercer. Terrific. That's cool. Yeah, weird. I think my only other brushes with fame were, well, I've met some Canadian CBC personalities, which sure. I'm always excited about. Sure. But at one point, uh, within about... A two-year stretch. I met Jack Layton, Stephen Harper, and Michael Ignatieff. And wow! That, and that was when they were all were curly. they all leaders? Yeah. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so 
it was about it was about a two maybe two three year stretch, and that was that was really exciting. For our not Canadian listeners, those at one point in time, those three names were leading the three major political parties in this country. So, yeah, that's like meeting the heavyweight politicians. Yes, it was meeting. Heavy. It wasn't yeah. just like it. It was. It was meeting. It, yeah. I, when I met Stephen Harper, actually, he was the Prime Minister of Canada at right. that time. Right. Um, and uh, the the other two gentlemen were in opposition parties, but right. uh, yeah, it was it was very interesting. And while I didn't actually shake hands with them, I I did come within a you know a an arm's length of our current prime minister, uh, Justin Trudeau. Yeah. Well, well. Yeah, and he's uh, larger than life. Yes, he is. He is. He's uh, not everybody loves Justin, but no, uh, no, 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 no. But you know, here here's here here was someone who's the prime minister. Yeah. You know, I felt the same way when I met Stephen. I didn't agree with uh, Stephen Harper's right wing politics, right. Uh, but I, I certainly was uh, touched by the fact that I got to shake hands with the sitting prime minister. Yeah. 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 Justin Trudeau does have a sort of uh, magnitude. Like there's a thing around him for sure. There, he's, I, I would say that of all the people that of you know all, any brush with greatness or stardom or or I mean, I, James Taylor was somebody that rendered me silent. Did you um, meet James Taylor? I did. Tell but us, it didn't tell us mean about it, James Taylor. It didn't mean anything because I couldn't say a word. <laughs> <laughs> I was total starstruck. It was ridiculous. Anyway, um, but yeah, Justin Trudeau, while a very a broad-shouldered and tall man mm -hmm. has a ball of charisma around him that must be about six feet in all directions. Yeah. It was just, it was uh, overwhelming. I felt. Mm. Yeah, it's weird how some people have that. Yes, he did complete, complete. Yeah, it just, I, I was awestruck by it. I bet. Mm. I bet. Didn't like it. It's uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, yeah. That's a very good word. It was very uncomfortable. Yeah. Most people I find uh, who have a lot of charisma tend it's uh, it's there, but it, of course it's his job to beam it out, right? This is this is yes. his career. This is what he does. Yeah. And he does. I thought he did it extraordinarily well. So James Taylor, yeah, went to the concert here in Summerside. Okay. Rushed the stage at intermission with my first edition of his first album, Pen in Hand. Phone ready, got up there, could not get the word out, just held it out to him, could not say, Will Couldn't you speak. sign this? Had my phone, and I, because I've been a long time fan of his music, so it was, a, it was a thrill for me to meet him. And this lovely young woman, and this, here's my opportunity to publicly thank her, said, Do you want me to take that picture for you? Oh. She was, she was, she was much more in control of the situation. And so, yeah, that was fun. That's wonderful. Yeah. Oh, man. Yeah, big entertainer for our city. Oh, yeah. That's great. With the likes of Sir Elton John. Really? Yeah. Reba McIntyre, uh, uh, Jerry Seinfeld. I, you know, the list is so long. Sting, that was a good one. They come to Summerside. They do. Where do they play? At our, our community center, which is um, it's a state-of-the-art center. We have a 5,000-seat uh, really? arena. Okay. Yeah. Well, that's it's a hockey town. You mentioned about hockey players earlier. There's a lot of hockey players that summer. Well, not a lot, but a number that summer on the island. Oh, do they? Yeah, and we have um, a number of Summerside residents that have gone on to make quite big names in in that industry. Oh, really? Mm -hmm. Interesting. Yeah. Yeah, London has a ton of those too. Part, yes, that's right. Partly because London, the London Knights are one of the powerhouse. Junior A programs. Yep, that's so right. a lot of NHL players come through London. Come through there. Yeah. And a lot of them tend to come back in summer in the area. Oh, yeah. I had a sneak. This is really weird. About two years ago, I, I, there's a little town outside of London called Kamoka. It's about 10 minutes from where I live. I can't believe I haven't even ever heard of Just it. Just a tiny little place. But I lived in Niagara Falls for 20 years. You wouldn't have heard of Kamoka. Like it's, it's a, a thousand people maybe. Like it's Clearly. a tiny little place. But a friend of mine who I play tennis with lives there and stuff. And like this little sort of text started going around. <laughs> go to the arena. Go to the arena. <laughs> yeah. Go to the arena. Yep. We have a friend, Kyle, who is a professional hockey player in Europe. Mm -hmm. But in the summertime, he comes back to Canada and he nice. skates with whoever's around. Yeah. I think Kyle tipped everyone off. You might want to come to the arena. So we pull into the arena in Kamoka in the middle of nowhere. And there's just cars like you wouldn't believe in the parking lot like <laughs> we're just really got around teslas and oh, ferraris yeah. oh, and like nice. and we're like 
some people are here. Yeah. And we go in and we look and on the ice, there's two ice pads in the place and they're both full of NHL players. Wow. Just cool. skating together. Yeah. Scrimmaging, playing. Yeah. And so it was like famous, yeah. famous, yes. huge hockey stars. And all of them. On the ice, just yeah. playing. And we just sat there and watched. It was cool. Like, so that area of Ontario has a lot of a lot of pros hanging around, too, because of the Knights program. So. so concurrent with my career in economic development at City Hall here, I also had a side gig at the cinema. Okay. So I worked at the cinema, at the movies. Yeah. Um, you know, sweeping popcorn, sure. taking tickets, yeah. working with my kid. Great. Yeah, it was awesome. So a very famous hockey player who summers here, Dion Phaneuf, came in one day. And the rule when people come is they have a ticket and they show it, they can go get their seat. But you know when you come out, because you decide after all, the popcorn smells so good, I'm going to go yeah, and get I'm some. I'm going to get some, yeah. So this fellow, this fellow comes in and, of course, everybody runs around going, yeah, that's Dion, that's Dion. Okay, fine. So I take his ticket and he and his wife go in and a couple of minutes later, he comes out and he says, I'm just going to go and get some popcorn. And I go, and I point at him, I go, do you have your ticket? <laughs> <laughs> and for the briefest of moments, <laughs> for the briefest of moments, he, 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 like, confusion hit his face. And then he, like, realized I was having him on. <laughs> and he was like, aha. Uh -huh. And I go, it's okay. You're the guy in the J's hat. Got it. <laughs> you have to be professional. Sure. Right? Um, yes, but you know what? I've always taken a lot of latitude with that word. Have you? I do. You know, people say, <laughs> I'm surprised, people say, uh, you ha uh, you only get one chance to make a first impression. This is true. Oh, no, I hate that. I hate that. It can be hard. I don't make good impressions, really, so yes, of course I hate do. it. you do. Oh, no, 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 no. When you walk into this here store, I do. Here I do, because do. I'm authentic here, right. and it's good, right? Yeah. But all my professional life, I had to struggle with that, so I, I really didn't like that statement, because... And I still really actually don't because I, I feel it's so limiting because uh, that's not enough. And we're not really that good at, at <laughs> you uh, work with a medium uh, and, the, and, and that's something I'm very interested in hearing about. Um, because I do believe that people, uh, have, there are people that can pick up certain vibrations that the rest of us ignore or don't want to know about or can't do. She's amazing. I bet she is. But most of us can't read a crystal ball. Most right. of us are not mind readers. Yeah. Most of us don't have those skills. So when we make a first impression, we're relying on badly developed uh, instinct. That's uh, what first impression is all about. Is badly it badly developed or underdeveloped? Underdeveloped. underdeveloped. Thank you for that correction. Okay. Or badly implemented. Poorly implemented. Maybe we just don't have a And lot people of get a first impression, and I think, like, what? Because you shook their hand? That's not the only thing. Right. There are so many things. And think about people, think about your wife. Mm -hmm. How many times in, your, in the length of your marriage has she surprised you in a completely different way that you never expected, that you never would have gotten on the first impression? Sure. That has made you fall in love with her again or right. more or in a new way. Yeah. See, first impressions just aren't that valuable. No. Well, you're right. It's weird for me sometimes because I, I do find myself occasionally in the company of relatively or outright famous musicians. And you've got to kind of pretend to be part of the club, right? Mm -hmm. Like, it's cool. No worries. Like, it's the worst thing to do is fanboy on somebody yeah. <laughs> yeah. backstage at a festival or something like that. <laughs> sure. You cannot do that. You've got to... <laughs> pretend to their cool. level right yeah, it's yeah. really weird yeah but you know people can see through that too so it's sure i don't know i just went and watched the movie yesterday and there's a marvelous scene in that extraordinarily well-written film which movie yesterday oh yesterday okay yeah extraordinary it's extraordinary but there's a movie in the there's a moment in the film actually that it's exactly what you described. So really? I have to encourage you to go and see it because it's, it's well worth, uh, I don't go to the movies very much anymore. I sort of, you know, after working there for five years, right. um, I, I finished with that pop culture. Um, but we did see this movie and it was brilliant. And it, there was a scene about, about that very thing. Yeah, that's interesting.
All right, I'll, I'll put it on my list. I don't see a lot of movies either. But, I know. But, but this um, one is about the Beatles. Yes, and we love the Beatles. Well, you you know what? And the, it, the screenplay was written by um, a chap who's written a number of, of films that I quite admire because of the cleverness of the of a script, which is, as you know, as a writer, a script is very, very difficult. Oh, it's like yeah. writing a short story, which is much harder than a, than a novel, right? It can be, yeah. Yeah. Because yeah. you have to bring everything, everything into that is, one point. Everything is yeah. brevity, right? Yeah. Everything has yeah. got to be so focused. Are you still writing? Are you writing now? Uh, not, no, not really. I, I am blogging a yeah. little, and we're heading back. To, we're heading back to Europe in a month or so, and I, I will do another tour blog for that whole five weeks. But I'm not. I'm not into a big project like I would like to be. That's okay, because what I hear is that you're still doing it. Well, I'm kind of holding on with. With chapped fingers. That's okay. To the rope. I I gave some advice to a young woman yesterday, and uh, and she was right. She's writing. Yeah. And she said, "Oh, or no, she's uh, no, sorry, she's not writing. She's a she's an artist, and she puts things on Etsy. And she goes, oh, but it's not really working.' And uh, and I'm like, okay, don't give up. Because right. the reason you started, I'm guessing, is because it you had to do this and yeah. it felt good. Yeah. So that part is important. And even if you only do a minuscule thing, if you stick with the game, you're going to come out like on top or high up there. Because most people drop out. Most mm. people give up. Most people just don't do it anymore. Yeah. And I, I, I see there's, there's, if you stick with it, and you just keep doing it. Yeah. Then you know it'll happen. Yeah, but- I, I I probably need to make some adjustments in what I'm trying to do. Like I, in the early like this is what I say about writing for me, is that nothing in the world makes me feel better than writing when it's working, and nothing in the world makes me feel worse than writing when it isn't working. So the way it, um, the way I react emotionally to it is powerful Mm -hmm. a professional has to have a certain detachment from that but the the fact that it resonates that way with me tells me that it's something important to me can i ask you a question yeah of course how are you defining working and not working yeah well that's a good question um working for me is actually tackling a big project that's that's what feels like working to me and you're, we're not videoing this, but you're making a sort of a smiley face right now. So what do you hear when I say that? Okay. So, um, that's not working for you. Right. Right. That whole thought is not working for you. Well, not right now, is it? Yeah. Um, so, um, I would say, um, just try doing something you like yeah. and forget about the project right. and like do all the stuff that you like. Cause because guess what? What? When you do that bit, yeah, like people are like really attracted to you, mm. <laughs> like everybody. This is how I feel. Right. Everybody likes me now. Because <laughs> <laughs> they didn't like you before. I'm not easy to like. Oh, um, I can't imagine that. Because this is because I'm so like I'm so you know I say keep saying I'm going to die broke, but I am smug. Right? <laughs> Which makes people laugh. But it's true. I feel so self-satisfied. I feel so happy. Right? I'm doing exactly something that works for me. I'm not making it work. What did you feel I'm like, just doing it. What did you feel like before you took this on? I mean, were you looking for something? Yeah. So, you know, it's that that's a good question, John, because I would say for a long time, like I said, like I said, I always wanted to be that person right. who knew from the age of six what they wanted to do. And it turned out... Um, it turned out that I was doing a lot of things, uh, that I didn't, I didn't believe in, um, I, that I didn't like, um, that, uh, felt completely wrong. Right. I mean, when you're doing things like that, you get, you, you're not happy. You're not nice to be around. Sure. You're not, you know, easy with yourself. Um, and, you know, um, and and so I mean I was I've always had you know good friends and good relationships but where I am right now and um, where I where I belong is uh is makes me feel so good that everybody likes that right, right? it's very appealing 
That's, and it's not something I do. It's just something that happens. No, it's a visceral right? thing. Like people, absolutely, people's own energy are is picking up on yours, mm -hmm. right? Well, this is why I say to you, um, when um, I mean, your whole body uh, changed, and I thought, oh, it's not just about. Uh, it's really like I thought to myself. It's really about how you think it should be. You, what you think is going to work, what what you what you think is the goal to be a writer is to do this thing, right? Um, but maybe it might just be like write a sentence every day that you feel proud of, right? One sentence, yeah. You know, take an hour with the sentence if you want. Be to be a poet with your words, right? You know, stop reaching for stop reaching for the holy grail mm -hmm. and just slurp out of the cup. Because it tastes good right there. You don't have to reach. You just have to do. I think wow. that's the thing. I think I think we are all constructed in North America. Uh, certainly, my my husband is British, and so I look at that culture and I read about you know cultures, and I think, oh, you know, we're always taught to g grasp the golden ring and and right. strive and try, and and I think, you know. I think actually we're all we're a much nicer species when we don't do that. When we when we don't try so hard. Right. When we just do what feels nice. And after a while, if you keep at it and you keep doing it, the things that feel nice, that in itself is a, the best body of work. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Well, my when I was quote unquote successful in the sense of producing work. All of that was flow, right? Right. It was all flow, and it came very, very easily to me. Things began to die when I began to try to direct it. I mean, I'm very conscious of this. Okay. I've, I've spent a lot of time going over what happened. Right. Right. But it, it's it's a long, it can be a long recovery. Yes. It was traumatic for me. I, I don't doubt to it. To not do this anymore because right. it's what I thought I was. Yeah. Right? It was the, de the death of an identity. Right? Yes. Um, the, my my thinking has had to mature. Was it a death, or was it just? Is it just been an interruption? Do you think? Well, I hope it's an interruption, but I most definitely have to reframe how I think about that, right? And change your language. So, what do you hear in my language? Well, I just corrected you, didn't I? Yeah, you did. Yeah, yeah, it, twice. Twice. Yeah. So when you um. Okay, so one of the things I've practiced for many years is good listening right. because words are so important to me. I think uh, very words almost have a flavor to me. Um, so I think about uh, what most people would call connotation a lot, and you know, and I think about what you said, and I, clearly you're in mourning, hmm. right? I never um, thought of it that way. Well, no, I think you are. You, I mean, you're, you know. Uh, you you got tense. You said the word death. You know, uh, talked about it in the past. You spoke about the grief. Hmm. You're in mourning. Hmm. Um, so, um, and that's fair enough. Um, but you know, maybe maybe there's just an absence, not a death. Hmm. You know, if you if you think about it like a death, then you'll make it real. Yeah, I suppose. So. Yeah. So, um. Maybe you need to have somebody help you uh, find a different channel. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, and maybe. say, like, it's, it's in. I, it's still in you, right? It's still there. Obviously, I can it's still, still knock there. out a blog post when I have to, or if somebody <laughs> pays me to write their website, which still happens. Oh, really? Um, do but, you do website content? Oh yeah. Oh yeah. I'm, Are I'm you just, an SEO background kind of thing? I don't. I don't put a whole lot of stock in SEO, but um, not anymore. Right, but yeah. um, I was an SEO expert. No, for for fifteen ish years, I've been well, thirteen years, a, a full time corporate freelancer, like yeah. mercenary. Yes, I understand that. You know? Yeah, it's never yeah. what I wanted to be. It was always supposed it's to nothing be. Nothing anybody wants to be. John. Right, it was always supposed to be a conduit to me producing yeah. my own work. Mm -hmm. But when you do something that you're miserable with, you get miserable. So how can the good stuff that come out? That affects everything about you. Yes, it does. It totally really does. I understand this. Listen, yeah. I, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm 55. I, I've, I've done things for probably 25 years that, or 20 years, let's say, that I did absolutely adore. Yeah. I had a job that I adored for about six years, and it was actually in marketing and sales. But really? I loved the product so much really? that I felt very much the same. 
Yeah. Um, um, you need you need to believe in what you, you do. You need to believe. You need to care about it. You need to love it. Um, and you know, it can be it can be really anything. I I think now that I look at um people who are successful, I think they're just doing what they really love. And even yeah. when like there was there were naysayers or they couldn't afford to do it or like all the things that make people give up, they didn't. They right. just kept doing it. Yeah. And I and I you know, I I, I that's important. I mean, like it's just just to stay in the game. Because you know, like the lottery. Mm-hmm. The lottery advertisements say, if you don't play, you, you can't, can't win. win. Right? Yes. So here's the thing. If you don't stay in the game somehow, right. then you're going to lose. Yeah. So even even if you just do something, um, and um, th- th- then then, you, then you're going to win because most people drop out. I know because I'm a dropout. I dropped out of three universities and two colleges. Did you? <laughs> really? I did. I'm unlettered. Unlettered. I'm overlettered. Are you? Okay. That's cool. I guess you could say no, not really. I wish I had the tenacity to finish a piece of my education. Just one piece. <laughs> one of them. <laughs> yeah, which is so. I and really one of the reasons why I didn't because I was always too busy reading. Really? <laughs> oh yeah. <laughs> Who did you read? What did you like to read? Oh, everything. I was lucky. I had a dad who uh, made an, a good enough salary to buy me books. Nice. Um, and he was a reader yeah. and he was British. So of course I went through all the British writers, Did like you? all the classics. Okay. And my mother was a reader. Um, and she read, um, for the most part, like, uh, pop fiction. Okay. So there was my dad with the classics and my mom with the pop fiction. Best of both worlds. It really, truly was. Yeah. And I adopted the book buying program very early myself. Great. And I was always a used bookstore buyer. Were you? Yeah. Uh, cause I could get more. Sure. <laughs> right. I could yeah. get a lot more. Um, the only time I ever bought a new book was at an airport when I was taking a flight. Yeah. That was my, that was a holiday treat. Okay. Yeah. The That's- first time ever was that I took a flight in June and I didn't buy a new book. So I was fortunate. I uh, And one thing led to another, I guess. Uh, so I was a young girl growing up in New Brunswick. And of course, I ended up reading Anne of Green Gables. Of course. When I moved to Niagara Falls, uh, one of the first shelves that I saw when I came in were the biographies. And there was a Lucy Maud Montgomery biography. Really? Now, I think I was maybe 15 I'd never read a biography, never thought about reading a biography. Always thought they were boring. So I read it, and it was great. And then I read one about Barbara Streisand. Mm. <laughs> and then I read more biographies, and and uh, um, and then I started uh, buying uh, Canadian literature and Canadian writers. So, you know, Pierre Burton, Farley Mowat, Margaret Atwood, Margaret Lawrence, W.L. Mitchell, all of those people, and I had huge shelves with all these books. This goes back to my Canadian lit days at university. Yeah, right? Go on. So I've read them all, and yeah. I've, I've read the fiction and the nonfiction. And then I guess I, I had babies, so I didn't get to read a lot. Um, <laughs> um, so what I did read then was kids' literature all over oh, again. Oh, really? Yeah, so I had another education of children's literature, which was awesome. Um, and then I discovered Harry Potter. Uh-oh. Thanks to my husband, who was adamant that I should read them. Really? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And you, I think he might regret it. <laughs> I don't know. Really? Do you remember yeah. who wrote the Ellen Montgomery biography that you read, by chance? I mean, this is going back a ways. Okay, so I'm looking at the shelf, and I think it was probably Wheel of Time, but I'm not, I, I, I couldn't tell you. And that's um, uh, Molly, what's her name, right? Dylan. Mm. When, I was, when I was in university, I went to the University of Guelph. Yeah. Studied English. I flunked out of Guelph. Good for you. Nice. Good for you. So we share that. I managed to survive my English degree at I Guelph. was at the bull ring, though. Good for you. Good for you. <laughs> Many times. That's a center of scholarship at, on campus. Where they served the beer. And uh, one of my professors was Mary Rubio, who was, I think, probably the preeminent L.M. Montgomery scholar, scholar in yeah. the country. Yeah. So I had some torturous night classes with her. Three hours of can lit. It was rough. But her husband was Gerald Rubio, who was kind of a mentor of mine, was oh, the nice. Shakespeare prof there. Oh, awesome. So, uh, yeah, he was he was a mentor of mine. I love reading Shakespeare, too. Yeah. I I've read, read uh, 
I've read all all of the Lucy Mod canon, and and actually, I think the current scholar is at U of Goo. Um, U of Goo. Oh yeah, sorry. That's <laughs> that's uh, that's uh, Cow University talk for University of Guelph. A fine, fine school. It is actually. Yeah. It actually is a fine school. I know it is. I yeah. know. I'm absolutely aware of yeah, that. But it's got this weird. Again, for the people who don't know the area, it's the it's the foremost agricultural university in it's certainly Ontario. I don't yeah. know about the rest of Canada. So you get this odd mix of people studying traditional academic programs and people who are studying ag economics and other ag diploma programs. And so well, it's, it started out, University of Gulf started out as, as, as a college, right? Yeah. Yeah. As specifically an agricultural college. Ag college. Yeah. yeah. And now yeah. it's like, it's where veterinarians go to yeah, train absolutely. because they have all the farm animals and all that stuff. Yeah. Although we have a veterinarian degree here at University of PEI, there you go. Um, but yeah, it, it, yeah, it was like it was a cow college uh, for a long for a, for a long time. Oh, that's right. Wonderful. You remember hearing that phrase oh, too? Of course. Yeah. Okay, so I lived in Guelph in the days when all the cool people were wearing rubber boots everywhere. Rubber boots. Yeah. Didn't you see? Yeah. Oh, so that would have been. I missed that. Okay. So when was I there? I guess it would have been the late eighties when I was there, okay. mm. and like all the. Anybody who grew up to vote green wore like those boots then. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Okay. Rubber boots. I don't know why. I didn't remember seeing any. I saw a few yeah. cowboy boots at Guelph, but yeah, not rubber of, boots. Uh, lots of uh, lots of those as well. That's really. I loved living in Guelph. Guelph is a great city. It's very pretty. It's a lot bigger now than it used to be. Yeah, I know. I catch up with them actually. Um, Actually, there is an inspiration of mine in, in, in the city of Guelph. Is there? Uh, it's called the Bookshelf Cafe. Okay. Um, and it was actually opened while I lived. I mean, the whole cafe and movie theater and restaurant bistro were opened when okay. I lived there. And recently, I had the opportunity to thank them via Twitter. Um, so now we follow each other on Twitter. Oh, and that's great. Yeah, it's really cool. And the library there as well, because mm. I was a, a big, I've always been an, and continued to be a supporter of libraries. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. No, Guelph's a great city. Yeah. Uh, I've gone back there to play nice. more than once. Yeah. Nice. And uh, it's it's just cool to be back in that town. I would love to ask you about your music, actually. But um, I have to tell you that really I'm a failure when it comes to any kind of music, except as a listener. Listeners. Um, I know that we're vital. I get, I get There's that. There's no music without them, my <laughs> I know, friend. I know that. <laughs> I can't carry a tune. I can't, I, I, like, I'm, I'm really, I, I, so I married a man who's very knowledgeable about music. Okay. So, cause to cover that, you know. We complete each other, right? Yeah, yeah. that's true. It's true. Right. At least that's how I feel. It's a good thing that he knows about the music because I don't. Uh, fair enough. What about my music would you like to know? I'm a hired gun these days. Is that right? Yeah. That's cool. It is and it isn't. Yeah. There are certainly upsides and downsides to it. Um, I play primarily with Sarah Smith as right. a London artist uh, who has been developing a national and international reputation as an independent artist. So I tour with her as far as Texas, the West Coast, yes. Europe over the last couple of years. But I also I also get hired to play for a bunch of other singer-songwriters. Um, and I've been previous to that a band guy. So I was yeah. until recently in a rock band called Hiroshima Hearts that I miss and um, been the drummer in several other bands. Um, and uh, these days I'm kind of looking for a place to land, to be honest. We have a very lively uh, music culture here in the oh, island. Yeah, I yeah. bet you do. Yeah. yeah. It's, All of the maritimes. Yes, you're right. That and that's yeah. that's you know what that's that's true too. Um, music is well fostered here and well loved, and uh, um, I would say with the infusion of a lot of newcomers over the last fifteen years to the maritimes, yeah. um, there's a lot more. Uh, there's a lot. The variety of sound uh, is much broader than oh, cool. original. Um, sort of, sort of Celtic, Scottish, right. Irish fiddle bagpipe. Everybody kind knows of what strain. you're talking about, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So there's, there's a, there's a lot of music happening here, and um, it's delightful. It's, uh, we go, I go to musical things. But That's good. Yeah, we need you no, to do listen, that. I, I've always, I'll, uh, I've always supported the arts and culture, always, 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 because I feel that it's, it's vital. Yeah. 
you know. And this is what I do now, too. Yes, and do. actually, there's something interesting. When I opened the shop, I was much gratified to see local people who have been engaged in culture in one way or the other since I've lived here come to the shop. That was to get in their support just to come by and say congratulations was awesome. That's great. Yeah. So. Yeah, you're part of the arts scene. Yeah, I know, right? Right. I know. That's really cool. I didn't. Ex I didn't. I didn't anticipate that. Really. At all. Yeah. yeah so it was a lovely surprise. No, that's wonderful. It's the arts need supported. My friend, I told you about my friend Chris Banks, who, mm -hmm. um, spoiler alert, is going to be a guest on this show in the next month or so. Oh, cool. Who's releasing a, Everybody get that? a new collection of poems. Nice. Um, poets need you to support their work. Yes, they do. I've had a poet in my shop. Have you? Come and read. Yeah, I had, I had That's a- That's a great idea. It is. It is. And uh, um, hadn't been done in this store, which had been existing in a, uh, before I- I purchased it. Um, it hadn't happened for a long time, so I'm looking forward to doing more of that. I've had uh, uh, two readings now. That's great. Yeah, Good. and uh, I've got another uh, chap who wants to come and do something, and and I I and unlike other used bookshops that take books on consignment, I don't do consignment. If I want the book, I'll buy. I say I can't afford to buy ten, but right. I'll buy three. I'll give you your price for three. Right. Yeah. That's so, great. I have another yeah. friend. You should walk out with money in your pocket when you go in and ask. Yeah. That's what I think. Yeah. yeah. Um, <laughs> episode number 1098 is with the young adult author Mary Jennifer Payne. Oh, cool. Some Canadian young adult novelist. Support those people. Oh, yeah. You know, and she does readings and stuff. Yeah. And, you know, go buy the books. It's, and support um, it's musicians hard work. And it's hard work. Right. Go to the theater and yeah. you know, like buy the buy the farmer's food from him. Do that. Yeah. Buy the local food. Yeah. Buy from the farmer. Buy from don't like don't go and buy presents for people at big stores. Look around you locally and find the people that are making beautiful things handmade. They will be grateful. And they've and, been made with love. There's yeah, divinity right? in those products. Yes, there are. Whether it's There's a book no of question. poems or That's a potato. Right. Yep. Yeah, it's very true. So what do you say to somebody who's staring down a dream right now that's intimidating, like buying a bookstore or anything? What do you advise people? Do what you want to do, because chances are, if you care deeply enough about it, it will be okay. Wow. Um, and okay means um, that you'll survive, uh, you'll find a way. Um it's not easy to chase, it's not easy to chase a dream in the arts because you, you very, very rarely make any money in the arts. Or in, or in entrepreneurship. Yeah. Of any kind. So a lot of people, a lot of people ask me the same thing. Like, how did, how did you get to this point where, you mm -hmm. know, you're beaming, as you said, beaming you with joy. You are beaming with you joy. You know, I glow with it all the time. You do. And I say, you know. Like it just answers every one of my need or uh, such a large set of my needs uh, that I'm very satisfied. I'm not afraid of the money anymore. I don't care. Here's the big thing. I don't care if I die poor now. Wow. And that's really hard F for me. I was brought up in a reasonably affluent environment. Mm. Um, I I was I was I was very fortunate. I mean. I didn't go to private school, but my dad did want me to. Mm. <laughs> I'm like, no, not me. Um, I, I was, I, I was very fortunate. Um, but there were many times in my adult life that I've been very, very poor. Um, mm -hmm. like very poor. And I'm, you know, I'm just not afraid of it anymore. I'm just, yeah. I, and I also believe that like I can earn a living. I can buy the food. You know, yeah. so that that was my husband's an artist too. So we we don't have an affluent lifestyle, right. um, but we have a very nice one. That's we have a thing. nice little house. It's like my thing lately <laughs> is, is to become kind of rich in experience. Well, um, I just thought like I just don't I don't care if I'm poor when I die. I don't care if I have struggles at some point. Yeah. Here I, I I can do this for a long time. I hope. Yeah. And 
I'm like accumulating the happiness every day. <laughs> you know? The so happiness bank is filling I've up. Never, I don't think I've been really this fully, extremely happy maybe three times in my life. Wow. When I was like 13 and got my pony. Ooh. See? When um, I bought uh, my, I bought a house. I bought my own house. Yeah. Um. And it wasn't an expensive house, people. I only had a $2,000 down payment. That's all it <laughs> took because it was a very, uh, and that was in Ontario. Yeah. And, um, and then when we, when we, uh, uh, started our family. Yeah. Yeah. When we, when we, like when we were a family, when we were four, right. one day I looked around and I thought, oh, this is awesome. Right. Yeah. And now here with your bookstore. And now I, yeah. And now I have the shop. That's wonderful. It's, uh, yeah, I'm really lucky. And, you know, of course, that begs the question. And here's something that I, took me a long time in my 40s to think about, and that was the word deserve. Oh, yeah. Because I used to say all the time, I deserve better. Hmm. I deserve more. I've worked hard. I'm a good person. I used to say those things and over and over until I really, really believed them. And yeah. I did. Yeah. And then all of a sudden I thought, <laughs> I didn't just... And that's the other thing people say. I didn't deserve that. Yeah. And I've said that. But now I don't think about that anymore. Now I don't spend time uh, thinking, do I deserve it or don't I or did I earn it? I just think, oh, um, it's just happening. Lucky me. I do think I say that a lot. I say, oh, lucky me. Gratitude is important. Yeah, it is, totally. It's, you know, it is important, in, which is why when I come in, Every morning, and I look around and I say, Good "Morning, guys. Hi, everybody. Here I'm back." I think wonderful. they miss me. I bet they do. I can feel <laughs> that. Books are very sentimental. Books are emotional. They they, are. they feed off you. And they, and you know, there's something about them. And this is this is the last little story I'm gonna I'm gonna tell you. Frequently, people will come in and they'll see a book and they'll pick it up and they really want it. Um, but it might be five dollars more than they really want to spend, which I understand. It might be a twenty-five dollar book, yeah. and they really want it, but they don't buy it. They put it back on the shelf because they can't afford it, or they're denying themselves a the five dollars, whatever, whatever reason they put it back in the shelf. And they often say things like, uh, I, "I'm going to think about it for a couple of days," and I go, "Do you want me to put it in the back and I'll hold it?" And they go, "No, no, no, that's okay." And I think, mm, "Okay," and they go, "No, oh, I'll come back in a couple of days." And they come back, but after they've picked that book up and loved on it the way they do, yeah. I'm not kidding you when I say that book has something uh -huh. added to it. And over and over again, somebody else will come in and they'll pick up the book and go, oh, I really want this. And they take it. Really? They, oh, it happens. It's, I just, I was just telling my, my closest friend about this. And wow. I, and like, she's like, really? And I'm like, I'm telling you, if you, if you came in here for a week, you would see it. It's unbelievable. What? It's the, str I never anticipate, it's strange, but it happens. I feel like, I feel, and I use the word glow. I feel like the book gets a glow when someone loves on it. And when they put it back, it's got, it shines. Uh, it shines brighter or something. I don't know what it is. So we don't see the shim. We don't understand the science. But it's, there's something that's happening there because it happens. Because I have the empirical evidence that says about the books that get picked up that go in two days. Wow. I, I don't know. know what to say. It's Listen, it's just it ha I don't know what to say either. I can only relate the story. I can't explain why it happens. I just see it happen. Wow. Mm. I feel like people are going to have the same sort of feeling after listening to you for an hour. <laughs> this has been amazing. Oh, this has thank been great. You. Oh, yeah. thanks. I, well, there, there was divinity in the shop. There was divinity in the interview. Oh, well, thank you. Yeah, I'm so grateful. I feel that way. I'm, and I'm really glad that you, that you did listen and come back. Me too. Yeah. Me too. And thank cool. you for this. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, maybe we'll be That's back. Really nice. Maybe we'll be back in a year and we'll. See how you're doing. Yeah, that would be fun. That would be really cool. Okay. I plan to be here. Good. Uh, hopefully, yeah. I'll be here too. Yeah, that would be nice. Okay, I'm going to hit stop. Okay. Thank you.
Thank you once again, gentle listener, for taking in today's show. Thank you as well to Nancy for being such an inspirational guest. If you want to know more about Nancy and the rest of my guests, go to www.john-huff.com. That's J-O-H-N-H-U-F-F.com. You can also find the show on Facebook at The John Huff Podcast. If you're an Instagram person, you can find me at JW underscore Huff. Please give me a follow for content that may or may not appear on the Facebook page. If you're an Apple Podcasts person, please do me a big favor and leave a rating and review of the show, preferably a positive one. That's all the time we have for today, but I'll be back very soon. Until then, keep your wits about you, and remember, good things happen when you put yourself out there. Bye for now. Ah, the tranquility of a summer morning. Broken by the sound of a chainsaw outside my window and cats brawling upstairs.